uh, welcome you guys to another session in our Women Lead online forums. Hi, Deborah. Good to see you. Uh, these are brought to you by Connected Women of Influence, as you know, and I'm Patty Vargas. I'm your host today, and we're delighted to bring yet another exciting discussion for professional women everywhere. And these online forums, you know, this is a, a new thing with CWI. We're doing them in several different formats, um, but they are designed for busy professional leaders, you know, who are uh, doing a lot, moving a lot, go on the go all the time. Some of the sessions are designed to be informative, where subject matter experts in their chosen field will share timely information to help expand your knowledge and help you make better decisions. And other sessions are intended to be thought-provoking conversation starters and maybe highlight topics that are in the news that affect professional women, both personally and professionally. So whatever it is that you're looking for, we have an online forum for you. You know, be, be assured of that. Now, our session today is going to last for an hour. Questions and comments are always welcome. Uh, to help us manage the conversation, why don't you send a note via chat, and then I'll recognize you and pull you into the conversation. And if you have a question that you'd like to pose anonymously, just send it to me instead of sending it to all of the attendees. Um, our topic today on Ask Me Anything uh, centers around the confusing, uh, difficult, challenging uh, world of mortgages, financing, credit, and more. Our expert in the hot seat today is John Burroughs of Skyline Home Loans. John is a senior mortgage consultant and has worked in the real estate finance industry since 1983. He's been named a six-time recipient of the San Diego Magazine Five-Star Lender Award for professional excellence in customer service. John has helped literally thousands of families with home financing needs from first home buyers, seniors reverse mortgages, private money loans, and sophisticated investors who are handling more complicated commercial transactions or estate planning needs. So John, anything that you want to add to that intro? Um, I don't think at the moment other than, um, I guess, uh, a proud Sioux talker now at this point in time. Yes, yes. And I guess uh, that was a, a major benchmark for me, something I was very proud to do, and uh, and I will say a very interesting journey along the way, but I'm, I'm very glad that I did it. I encourage anybody uh, who's even contemplating that to investigate and to consider that for future talks Perfect. as they go. Awesome. That's great. Great. Awesome. Um, and I might mention, uh, if you guys are not, if you don't have something to say, maybe keep yourself on mute so we can minimize um, some of the feedback. Um, it sounds good to me. Everybody sound, everyone have good sound right now? I've got um, plenty of information to share here. So I do encourage people if they have any questions whatsoever, it's not just about me talking. It's about me helping other folks uh, become enlightened to this whole process because it can be, oh, a little confusing at times. And as this market ministry has changed, it's, it's an ever evolving process. Yes. Uh, and for 35 plus years, I've learned to roll with the punches, <laughs> you know, and, and adjust to the changes because there certainly have been many, many, many of those throughout the years. Yes, absolutely. Well, John, first off, um, I know that you have a special program called the Home Access Program. And why don't we just dive into that? And it's, it's a little unique. It's something that you only offer. So why don't you tell uh, the folks on the phone about that? Well, I'd be delighted. So the um, the concept for the home access program has really been around the industry for a long time, but it's one thing to talk about things. It's another altogether to be to implement them in a manageable way. So as a mortgage banking corporation, our company, which is substantially large, all 50 states, and we are a direct lender. Well, we saw the need out there in the community to be able to offer some incentives and programs to help soften the blow financially of an expensive process. Let's face it, if somebody's buying a home or even selling a home or just doing a simple refinance, 
I mean, there's, there's money involved. So what we came up with is the Home Access Program, and we offer this to all CWI members. So I'm asking everybody to spread the word because this is unique, and this is really our first format to dig into it in, in great detail. So what this is all about, Patty, is that our company will take any CWI member, and for that matter, a member of any group, and I'll delve into that a little bit, in greater detail because this could be an advantage to you as a business owner if indeed you have your own business or have employees we can roll this over and have your your employees and yourself take advantage but for CWI members anytime somebody brings a transaction to us as a mortgage banking corporation and whether it be a buyer of a home or a seller of a home or people just simply refinancing we will offer monetary incentive and discounts to those individual members. And I am really glad to say that they have sweetened the pot dramatically just in the last two weeks on this program. Our corporate gave us the green light. But as a lender, we will give a $1,000 credit, lender's credit, to any borrower that we have. So if you're simply refinancing your home, we'll be able to credit $1,000 to offset your closing costs, whether that be title or escrow or the appraisal fee, whatever. And that's a pretty substantial incentive. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to that, if you are a buyer, now we have CWI members that are licensed realtors, professionals, and we'll work hand in hand with those member realtors. So if you are a buyer and they are representing you, not only will you benefit from the $1,000 lender credit, but those realtors and brokers are part of the program too in that they will take a percentage, I believe 20% of their earned commission as a buyer's agent or even as a listing agent, as a seller's agent, and credit that back to the member as well. And that could run into a substantial figure as well. I did the math. Patty on this, just simple math, and I used a sales price of $600,000, and in Southern California, that's uh, just about close to the median home price for San Diego County and for Orange County. Mm -hmm. So $600,000 purchase, and if you were buying that property, the commission coming from the agent would be approximately $3,000 credit and toss in another $1,000. So $4,000 total is the potential benefit in pocket, or I should say maybe not out of pocket, <laughs> for cost for the buyer or the seller in this circumstance. So as you can see, that's, that's substantial. And I don't know of any other program out there that is offering that level of incentives to the membership too. Yeah. So that's um, that's awesome. You know, and that's just, you know, yeah. another one of the, the benefits of the, the community, you know, that we have in CWI. So that's really, that's awesome, John. Very generous. That's great. Well, we're also working with a couple of potential members too. I won't let the cat out of the bag here quite yet, but uh, we're encouraging some other industry related uh, types of businesses where they too might participate and be able to sweeten the pot a little bit. But for right now, we have the agents in place and of course myself and my partner, Rebecca Ross, who is my lending partner mm -hmm. with uh, Skyline Home Loans, and then our um, immediate supervisor, uh, Taylor Stevens, is at our main office in Rancho Bernardo. Between the three of us, we'll coordinate this process and make sure that uh, the borrowers see that benefit. And I'm glad to say that we just actually closed the transaction for a, um, a member-related um, home access program. And they were very delighted with that. And it's turning into multiple situations or multiple transactions. Wow. So I'm really happy about that. And I'm real proud to be part of this process. We will be getting, uh, Patty, we'll have, uh, and this is just rolling out here like in the next week and a half, we'll have some marketing information to be able to share with membership so we can digitally get it out there so and spread fun. the word a little bit further. So I'm very happy to say all of our ducks are in a row. And this is something you could take advantage of or any member right away. So. That's great. That's great. So, John, just to, to talk about um, 
sort of the whole world of, of mortgage uh, lending and so forth altogether. I know that, that you are a mortgage banker, right? And That's correct. what is the difference between a mortgage, mortgage banker and a mortgage broker? Um, that's a great question, too, because a lot of times those terms get thrown around. Um, it, it's really simple. A mortgage banker like ourselves is defined as a, a direct lender. Mm -hmm. We will be lending our own money. Quite literally, we have many, many millions and millions of dollars of lines of credit. So as a mortgage banker, it is our job to originate loans from wherever they come from purchase, refinance, et cetera. And by the way, we do every kind of loan under the sun. So I'll just use lending in general is quite diversified in the loan types. But when we do a loan, we will be funding that loan 99.9% .9 of the time right out of our own pocket. We will be funding the loan, originate it, process the loan, get the approval uh, that is done and approved to the criteria of the investor we will sell it to. So a mortgage banker is the bottom line when it comes to decision making in most cases and we will fund the loan and then after the loan has funded we will package up that loan with maybe uh, arbitrarily I'll say maybe another 10 million dollars worth of loans that are similar to it and then sell it off to the secondary market mm -hmm. in the form of mortgage-backed securities on Wall Street okay so that's the bankers role now the brokers role is when, when they are not a direct lender they will originate a loan process, but they will send it to another third party. And that third party is the decision maker who will then fund the loan. So the broker has control up to the point where they can price the loan, know what the programs are all about, and then shop it out to a number of different entities, but they are not the direct lender. Mm -hmm. And that is where I think, in my opinion, mind you, that the banker's edge comes into play because we are the bottom line. And it is our underwriters that make those decisions. Now, granted, we have to make sure that we have met all of the criteria for that secondary market, because if we make an error, it's on us. And we don't want to be looking at buying loans back. In fact, it gets very, very expensive. So we take the risk. You know, we shoulder the burden of making sure we've done everything right. Mm -hmm. And then as that direct lender fund it and then sell it off to the secondary market. So. Control, I think, being the biggest uh, issue right there. Well, and probably a little bit of uh, ease to your um, to your customer as well. You know, kind of a one stop shop. Yeah, we're we're taking the middleman out, and of course, with size comes flexibility, and uh, you get the attention of Wall Street. The more dollars that you're funding, and I wish I had my uh, I do have a little glitch, a technical glitch today, but. I, I have a ticker every single day tells us where we're at funding nationwide and the numbers of billions of loans that we're doing on an ongoing basis. But with that kind of size comes the ability to attract other investors that wish to buy the loans that we're originating. So again, another one of the advantages is that that leaves us open to just about every kind of loan program that is out there in the secondary market and on Wall Street and beyond. Mm -hmm. And even some private investors, for that matter, as well. That's great. That's great. Um, you know, what are what are all of those acronyms? You know, that you hear. I I think I understand like VA and FHA, but then there's there's a ton more than that. There's FNMA, FHL, MC, uh, conventional, Cal. I mean, what what is that alphabet soup all about? <laughs> You know, it's funny, you took the words right out of my mouth because my mouth, I'm chuckling to myself because I remember a presentation I did to a group of realtors. I'm going back 20 years probably. And that's exactly what we called it was alphabet soup. And because all of these, and of course, this is our language. And like any industry, you're going to have your own vernacular. Yeah. Uh, but you have the entities in the secondary market. And these you'll see in print quite often, or you'll hear them on the on the news reports and such when they're talking about housing industry. So the first one, probably the biggest two, not probably, they are the two biggest entities of mortgage-backed securities that will own those and service them are Fannie Mae, F-N-M-A, okay. Fannie Mae, and you'll see that a lot, Federal National Mortgage Association, 
and F-H-L-M-C, hard to say, Freddie Mac. So we have Fanny and we have Freddie, and you will hear those terms tossed around a lot. Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, and they are the uh, entities that will purchase the vast majority, and they are the largest holders of mortgage-backed securities, I guess to say probably in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, those two are on the conventional side of lending. They are not insured by government entities. Uh, <clears throat> and right now, we have the two biggest government-backed loan programs, FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, and everybody's, I think a lot of folks are familiar with FHA. That's been around forever and a day. Mm -hmm. That is a government-insured mortgage loan that requires minimal down payment, but every participant that receives an FHA, if they apply for one, has an insuring cost to it. So in the unlikely event or the hopefully the event never occurs where somebody loses that property through foreclosure, mm -hmm. that insurance cost covers the loss so that the lender doesn't suffer the blow. It is the insurance cost that will take care and secure a certain percentage, like about 25% of the loan amount. Simple example, if you borrowed 100 grand and you defaulted on your mortgage, the FHA insurance would pay the lender, whoever owns that loan, say $25,000 so that it mitigates their loss. But this is what keeps the program alive. Mm -hmm. Very similar thing happens with VA, Veterans Administration, which of course for active duty military and or retirees and even reservists. And even in some circumstances, uh, the the widow or widower of an of a veteran that was um, that died in line of duty. Mm -hmm. So you have that also advantage of a government insured program that will allow very liberal guidelines on an excellent program. And anybody that has the ability to get a, a VA, if you do meet the criteria, I have to say probably the best loan program on planet earth that I can think of because there's zero down payment required. And yeah. where do you see that? Yeah. And an insured entity as well. Yeah. That's great. That's uh, that's what my loan is, is a VA. Yep. <laughs> so, and, and then you mentioned the Cal Hafa program, that Cal Hafa program, that's an indigenous state of California. That's just a great down payment assistance program. It mm -hmm. does have some twists, and turns along the way, but if uh, looking for a minimum down payment, they also do down payment assistance and closing cost assistance programs. So if you have somebody who's real skinny on money but still thinks they can qualify income-wise and make the payment, it's an excellent option to be able to get into a property with very, very little, and even in some circumstances, nothing down on an insured loan program. So again, another one of those excellent programs for those first-timers out there. And you do all of these loans, John? Absolutely. These and many more. Uh, and of course, you know, I could go on for probably an hour alone just talking about programs. I'm not going to bore our audience with that. But <laughs> I guess if, if if there's, I have a saying out there, if the deal can't get done, if the, we can't do the deal, the deal probably can't get done. So if there's a program out there, we have access to it. And if for some unlikely reason I don't, I'll certainly find out who does. Great, so. great major benefit there. So, you know, John, I think that um, most of us still remember 2008 when uh, everything started melting down <laughs> and nothing was normal anymore. And I wonder what, what kind of insights do you have? First of all, did you see that coming? Were you concerned about these, you know, nothing down ginormous loans or um, and how have we, how has this maybe changed over the last decade? You know, that is a, is a really excellent question because yes, I was there and I experienced it firsthand. And um, anybody who happened to be lucky enough to be at the Sioux Talks here this last two weeks ago, I uh, will know I addressed that exactly. And it was uh, something I don't think a lot of people saw coming. There were a few brilliant people out there that benefited from it because they did what we called shorting the market. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, there's a great film out. Uh, came out a couple of years ago, right at Christmas time. It was called The Big Short. Probably one of the best 
movies I had seen in years. And who would have ever thought that somebody would uh, do an Oscar nominated movie about mortgage banking and lending? I mean, how ho-hum is that? Well, they did an excellent job of uh, showing how this process worked. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of people did not see it coming, and a big part of it was all due to the subprime market. Mm -hmm. And you are 100% correct. When when you could get a loan by fogging a mirror, no income, no asset, not even proving. I mean... To me, in my mind, I thought that whole process was crazy. I personally avoided participation in it because I just didn't see it uh, as being a a viable source for lending that had a long-term sustainability. And a lot of companies just fell apart as a result of being uh, invested too deeply in that type of a marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. So... When it happened, and I don't know if you remember, we went from fog in a member, uh, mirror to getting a loan to it went so far in the opposite direction. Right. I think the marketplace and government entities that were now overseeing it actually ended up hurting the people they were trying to help mm-hmm. uh, by over-regulation. And so that happened. It's just now, I would say, Patty, probably the last, two years that we've really seen things starting to lighten up and return to what I consider normal, you know, common sense guidelines, reasonable expectations. Uh, You know, certainly I'm all for regulation and controls to avoid any problems or defaults. Mm -hmm. But when you take it to the extreme where even good, solid, rock solid people with excellent credit having difficulty get a loan, you actually hurt the industry more. So, Right. Uh, I'm glad to see that it is returning back to what I consider normalcy, where you have a little wiggle room and negotiation room or have underwriters or the criteria be reasonable. Yeah. Uh, so very pleased to see that. So I'd like to see some balance, and I think that's kind of where we're at right now. That's great. That's great. Um, John, Eva had a question about um, the, all of the different home loans that you were discussing, and she wanted to know if some of the new options have replaced the city and county home ownership programs. A, a good one, too, because you do see these uh, uh, programs pop up once in a while. So you don't have certain cities, municipalities, or counties will come up with down payment assistance and or grants and such. And a lot of times they will come and go with the marketplace before they'll have limitations on the, how much money is available. And then sometimes they will run out. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't seen a ton of them. San Diego County was very, very active in this for a long time. And there would be certain parts of the county. I know Oceanside for a long time had a great program going, uh, but they come and go with the flow of the cash as it becomes available. I see now more mainstream programs, like I mentioned prior, uh, the Cal Hafta program, mm-hmm. as long as you're meeting the uh, first time by home buyer requirements, the Cal Hafta program, I think, has, has substituted or replaced a lot of those programs uh, because they're not necessarily, they're not restricted to a geographic area. And in some areas, too, there are income limitations occasionally. And meeting the criteria for a first-time home buyer doesn't mean literally. It means you may not have owned a home in the last three years. Right. So right. even if you owned a home and even lost one, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago, like a lot of people did, you could come back to the well since that uh, time frame and be able to go back out there and dip your toe in the water again. Yeah, that that's good. I'm glad that you said that because my, you know, what I was thinking about is um, a first-time homeowner or somebody who's getting back in the market after having been out for a little bit, you know, it's, it's really daunting and the, the loan application process is daunting. So can you just kind of walk us through, where do you start? How, how does it work? Well, the starting place is generally speaking, having a good clear picture of what your goal is. Now that may sound silly, but I can't tell you how many uh, buyers that don't, well, they don't know what they don't know. And that's you know, no reflection on them. But the education part is a big part of it, too. Just kind of figuring out 
you know, what am I trying to accomplish here? If it's simply finding, putting a roof over my head, but how long am I going to be where I'm going to be? Mm -hmm. uh, if I do buy a house, is this to be a long-term issue or is there something in my future down the road? I see where I could be leaving the area. Is this uh, where there's children? Is this focused on a school, uh, school district? Uh, so again, what am I trying to do here? Stop paying rent is usually the first <laughs> The first answer to that question, but where they begin is getting their goals, personal goals, clearly in mind. And once you've done that, then the second stop is is the money part. Let's face it, unless you're writing a check and paying cash for a house, you have to have the funds to be able to make the deal fly. So that's where coming to a mortgage banker or a broker like myself and start with the pre-approval process. And I want to make a clear distinction here. You hear the term pre-qualification and pre-approval. A pre-qualification is my opinion on a piece of paper you know, based, granted, on a lot of experience. I can usually figure that one out pretty quickly. But a pre-approval means that you as a potential borrower or buyer have done all of your homework, have stepped up to the plate, made a formal loan application, submitted all the documentation that you normally would, to get any kind of loan in the form of tax returns, W-2s, pay stubs, you know, whatever that might be, verifying you actually have the funds necessary to close the transaction. And we will literally put it through our underwriting software, which is industry standard nationwide. So we call these automated underwriting systems, and there's a very a few of them out there, but they're standard nationwide. So we will literally put it through the underwriting software and it's going to come back with a, you know, a red light, meaning we have a problem here. A yellow light means we can probably tweak this and get it fixed. But you're looking for that green light mm -hmm. where we want an approved loan that is eligible for sale. And so now we have a dollar figure in mind where you're approved up to your maximum. We know exactly what that is. And then we release you with your realtor to go out there and start shopping for a loan because when you submit an offer and this is critical patty to the process if you're a serious buyer when you submit an offer they're going to want to see that pre-approval letter mm -hmm. not just a pre-qualification but that right. approval letter and verification that you have the funds to close the loan and that yeah. is when you're going to have your strongest offer your best chance of an acceptance by a seller ready willing and able to sell that property. That's good. I didn't realize there was a distinction between those two. So that's that was a, a good clarification. So, you know, here's the million dollar question. Um, what if you have credit problems? You know, I think um, there's probably very few of us who have skated through life completely green, never, never hit a bump in the road. But what what kind of credit challenges do you see people needing to overcome and how do you help them? Uh, that's a great one too. And by the way, we do have a CWI member who is an expert in that field too. Mm -hmm. So we have ready uh, and able to assist any members that are in that situation of taking a look and doing an analysis. It costs you nothing, absolutely nothing to get an opinion mm -hmm. and to look through that. So first thing, if somebody has some real issues, and they're saying, I don't think I can do this. And or I tell them, I don't think because of these challenges, we'll be able to get you where you need to go. However, over time, there are things you can actively do. So I will then refer them to people who are experts in that field to take care of the system with getting those scores, those credit scores to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Now, what I do see, and I think everybody should be getting a look at their credit report pretty much on an annual basis. And there's a lot of free uh, resources out there to be able to do that. But take a look at your credit because I can't tell you the number of times that we've had good, solid credit, excellent borrowers, and have something pop up that they're unaware of. Yeah. I'll give you a good example of something from just a couple of weeks ago was a small little medical bill that was presumably paid by my borrower's uh, copay or uh, insurance company. And it slipped through the crack somewhere and ended up with a, it was like a $49 collection and yet it affected their score. Not a dramatic amount, but they had no idea what it was at. Other than that, 
you'll see perfect credit. That is more common than you would think. Mm -hmm. Or mistaken identity sometimes will have an issue come into play or public record. Maybe there was something that came up that was unrelated to your credibility as a borrower, but maybe there was some legal issue that uh, resulted in the public record that might affect the overall picture too. So knowing your credit first, taking a look at how you manage your debt, and there are even some brilliant um, analytical tools that we have through our credit reporting companies that can look and do a reverse analysis of the algorithms used for predicting credit scores and teach you how to actively rearrange your debt. If I just paid off this bill here or I transferred that balance over there, that could boost those scores up that could have a long-term effect mm -hmm. on uh, even the interest rate you get. So uh, credit challenges, number one, be aware. And then let us take a look at it because even if there are problems, there are ways that we can usually work to rectify them and improve those scores. Great. And that's a critical yeah. part of the equation. That's, that's good to know. That's really good to know. You know, there's um, some of the maybe less conventional types of, of financing or um, real estate questions, you know, that come up sometimes. And I, for one, the whole idea behind a reverse mortgage, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is, is that, or is it one of those, it depends questions? Yeah, we get um, a fair amount of inquiries on reverse mortgages. Now, our parent company, um, which is on the East Coast of Finance of America, um, our parent company has an arm, and they do probably, they are the second or third largest producer and funder of reverse mortgages in the entire United States. So that is a substantial part you know, of their portfolio. Now, reverse mortgages are for an individual or individuals, a couple or individual over the age of 62. And essentially, it is a great tool for the right person. Mm -hmm. So it was designed to help our seniors who may not be able to handle things in an ever-changing world economically, or maybe they just don't have enough income from whatever resource that they have here to cope with inflation and the cost of living, because that certainly isn't getting any cheaper. We all know that. So reverse mortgage uses the equity from an individual's home, and generally it's rather substantial, to do one of several things. Create an income on a regular monthly basis, or to pay off a mortgage that's on the property and eliminate the monthly payment altogether, or use it as an equity line of credit where they can tap into it to say, pay off major indebtedness, uh, bills, uh, do improvements to the property, or any combination of the above. And it's a simple mathematical equation where we look at the equity of the property, the age of the individuals. And this is the beautiful part about it. Patty, you do not have to qualify. It's not like getting a regular mortgage. The documentation is very similar, but you do not have to qualify for a monthly payment because we are essentially eliminating that payment. So oh. as it implies, the balance on your mortgage, you're not paying anything off, you're doing the opposite, and the equity is growing. Now, these loans got a lot of bad rap years ago when they were maybe not designed as well as they are before, and the vast majority are insured by FHA. Again, it's a government-insured program. Mm -hmm. But I have seen this be a real life-changing uh, event for many seniors who I quite frankly wonder how they care for themselves mm -hmm. and even properly you know, able to meet, uh, have ends meet and to be able to limit a mortgage payment or create an income or do the things they need to so they can stay in their home. And more and more, I think a lot of certified financial planners are seeing this as an excellent tool to manage portfolios, even if you're not on a cash flow crunch. Mm -hmm. So it's an amazing program and very in-depth. And I encourage anybody that doesn't know about it, that is thinking, well, let's have some interest there is to give us a call because we're quite expert at explaining this. And there's a ton of information out there for the general public. And uh, we, I have this conversation with at least one person a week. 
wow. with regard to what can I do and is this for me? Mm -hmm. So great program for the seniors. I just want to remind everybody, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat window. Um, we've got, I've got a long laundry list of things I can ask John since I've got him sitting here and he's a captive audience with us, but I want to make sure that I make room for any questions that you might have as well. Um, so John, here's something that came up just recently um, with some friends of ours. There are five adult children and they mm -hmm. just inherited their parents' home. And it's a, a lot of property. It's a, you know, a ranch land and, and a home and all of that. And they're trying to figure out what to do. They obviously, nobody wants the property. They want to sell it off and buy one another out. I think one of the brothers would like to keep it possibly in his family. But what, what kind of things do you see happen when a situation like that comes up? Well, I don't know that you knew this about me, Patty, but I have um, kind of a niche part of the mortgage business that I, I've kind of stumbled into myself about eight years ago. And I was getting calls uh, from a state planning attorney, a couple in, in individual or specifically, one of them being my own estate planning attorney, that said, here's what we want to do. We have uh, siblings that want to buy each other out, but what came into play was that they rec realized that there's a proposition out there in uh, California Proposition 58, where uh, in San Diego County, we do a lot of this, where the children of the decedent can retain the original property tax base. Now that may not sound like a big deal, but I am looking literally at an example of one from a few weeks ago, where the parents bought the property so very long ago mm -hmm. that their property taxes currently <clears throat> are you sitting down or a mere $48 a month <laughs> on a home that's valued at about $550,000. So wow. that's mom and dad's old tax base because they got it a gazillion years ago. Right. And their situation is there in their case, their four siblings, three of them say cash me out. And the fourth says, I want to keep the house but I also want to retain the property tax base. So there are ways to go about doing that, and it has to be done very, very meticulously to make sure that individuals cross all the T's and dot all the I's that the county has put into these rules as a result of the old Prop 13. Well, they can do that if handled correctly. Well, we did the assessment said, if you don't do this and just buy your siblings out, your property tax base, and we know what it is, those taxes were going to go from $48 a month, get this, to $452 a month. Mm -hmm. Now, that's $404 a month every single year forever. Yeah. And you know, do the math on that one. It isn't going to take too long to realize that taking an extra step, even though it may cost a few thousand dollars in equity, but taking an extra step to preserve that tax base is a great idea. Mm -hmm. Now, if the property taxes are not in the situation like this, where there's going to be a substantial difference if the county reassesses, then there's another whole process. There's a special refinance section of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans mm -hmm. that address that specifically, specifically on inherited property. So. Uh, you do need to be working with somebody who's expert in that arena so that they handle the transaction properly. But it can be done, and if the tax situation is such as my example, there's a way to hang on to that, and we handhold throughout the entire process. So uh, you will get a lot of uh, strange looks if you walk into your neighborhood bank and uh, talk to, and I don't want to be bank bashing here now, but. Uh, a lot of times you'll have a little bit less level of expertise if you're just dealing with the nine to five mentality and mm -hmm. without that experience comes into play. They may look at you like you've got three heads and what are you talking about when you say, here's what I want to do. So yeah. uh, get a second opinion if you're not getting the answers you think you want to hear right, right out the gate. Great. Uh, what happens... Um when you get a divorce, like what, what are some options if, if you're contemplating a divorce, your marriage is ending, you have a home, um, what, what are some of the options people have? 
You know, it's, uh, I took a class, and you never stop learning. Uh, this old dog still likes to learn new tricks. So um, I took some classes, and in-depth classes, which was, were quite enlightening here just a couple of months ago because I, I wanted to become more knowledgeable in that arena. And just like if we talked about inherited property, I mean, that usually you, know, you lose a family member, and that's usually a kind of a devastating period of time. And, you know, to work through that process, well, a divorce is very, very similar in that there's obviously a loss of a loved one. And I don't care how amicable the process is, if you're lucky enough to go through that uh, route as opposed to the opposite that we hear of all too often. Mm -hmm. But it's a tough time. And uh, you have responsibilities. If you've acquired a property together and both on a loan, you really need to take a look at uh, how to handle that situation so that both all parties are protected, uh, both physically, like the property itself, the integrity. And many times you'll have one spouse that wishes to purchase the property from the other spouse and, and receive equity, their portion of it, uh, however they want to deal with that to make sure that the vision of property is handled properly. Uh, but that can be... Um, a difficult situation if you don't have an amicable divorce. So we're trained and I'm going through that certification process to be that objective third party. And oftentimes if there's a sale involved, we have realtors that are also trained and certified in this arena. And I strongly urge people to seek out those uh, persons that are experienced with that process so that they know what pitfalls is to steer you away from is I've seen way too many circumstances where if it was a buyout with a spouse retaining the property ended up shooting themselves in the foot financially and really got in over their heads or hadn't planned properly for the disposition of the property, its physicality, taking care of it, maintaining, finding out what's wrong with it. So really complicated. And I, I stress, I can't stress uh, strongly enough, that if you find yourself or have friends, and let's face it, that's 46% of America, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say, they're going to be there at some point in life. Yeah. So uh, that being said, you need to find expert opinion and assistance in navigating that little maze. Yeah. You can get lost easily. Yeah. That's good advice. And sometimes in the in the heat of the moment or the emotion of the moment, you, we don't make the best decisions. Yes, and we've seen that. And you know, something uh, I'll, I'll mention here, we have a collaboration in San Diego now. I've gotten together with a handful of uh, other professionals. And we get the mortgage side of things, but we've also dealt with um, entities that specialize in, in uh, issues with children when you're going through a separation divorce. But we have professionals in financial planning that are expert in divorce situations, certainly family law attorneys, mm -hmm. the realtor part of it. So we have a group that is growing now in San Diego. It's a collaborative of all these different uh, professionals that could chime in on this process and where you may not need this person's help, but maybe the financial division, the mediation part of it is a big part of that process. So yeah. not just my end of it, but we can handhold and point you and refer out to a number of professionals uh, for things that even I hadn't thought about until I started down this road here. Yeah, that's great. That's good. So um, I'm a huge HGTV fan. And so I see all of these flipping shows, you know, uh, Flipper Flop and Flipping Las Vegas and, and all of that. And it looks so easy and uh, you're going to make a ton of money, you know, every time you do one of these. So tell, tell us the truth about that, John. Is this a, a viable way to get rich? Well, it's like anything. You better know what you're doing. Um, I do have friends. Um, that have been professionals for a very long time that are actively involved in this process. But understand for everyone that's successful at it, there's probably about eight, nine, or 10 others that, that aren't. Uh, it's either last, lack of expertise or uh, buying something too high, thinking they're going to make a killing on it. So you had better know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Can you make money? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there are even programs out there 
loan programs that are built specifically for the fix and flip individuals. You know, and, and that's, uh, we have a proprietary product with our company where they literally will say, we, we want to see your track record. Have you done this before? Mm -hmm. And we will help you with a loan problem to be able to acquire properties, give you the cash to do the repair, and then flip that property for a profit. And we're basing everything essentially on the finished value of that property after repairs have been done. Mm -hmm. So there's a great tool if you're a serious investor to go right down that road. And yeah, if you have the expertise and the team in place to do so, um, starting right out the gate thinking you're going to make a killing on it, unless you have some very deep pockets, um, you know, I don't see a lot of success stories when, when they've gone about things ill-advised. But yeah, it is possible. Maybe teaming up and having a partner. Uh, the vast majority of a lot of these, uh, Patty, I see a lot of cash buyers on these situations. So I'm not getting involved. They're literally showing up and making a good offer, writing a check, and purchasing right. the property. Right, right. And they know where they're going after that. But uh, yeah. but there are programs, or even to do a rehab. Uh, maybe you say, I'm I'm handy. I'd like to buy a property and fix it up. Maybe I'll, you know, a year or so down the road, and I'll, you know parlay all of my equity I've built up in it. So you can make money that route, but I say make, take the time to educate yourself thoroughly and understand the money part of it. Let's face it, isn't that what it's all about? Yeah, exactly. So here's the bottom line. Yeah. Give us the bottom line. Um, bottom line, I wish that... Um, I wish personally that uh, in this market in San Diego that there were more properties that would fall into this category because I, I think I would probably be right in there with the others. I've been doing this quite a while as well, but I'm not finding uh, that many properties out there that fit into the category. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, because real estate is what it is in San Diego County, uh, you usually don't find that many properties that are in disrepair. Certainly, they're out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but, too, if they're too far under market value, you probably got some co contractor or professional flipper that's going to snap it up some. Yeah. But I'm more than happy to sit down with people, too, and say, hey, here's the process. If you're really thinking of doing this, and I have a buyer right now that's really looking at the property that way and thinking I'm going to be adventurous and Finding that diamond in the rough, I think that's the real challenge there. Yeah. So, bottom line, you can make a buck, sure you can. <laughs> that's great. So, John, are there some interesting trends that we should be aware of, things that, that are uh, popping up as, as being a new trend, something uh, new on the horizon? Um, I think there's a couple things that come to mind right now. Uh, earlier in the show, we were talking about what happened during the meltdown, and we talked, I used the word subprime. Right. Okay, so when the first loan programs were designed, and we're going back many, many years here, that were designed for what we called stated income individuals. Yeah. Stated income loans, when they first originated, I thought were a brilliant idea, because if you're a self-employed individual, you're going to do everything in your power to legally take every single deduction allowable by IRS codes to pay the least amount of tax as possible. It's called tax avoidance, not tax evasion. Big, big difference. So if you're using legal deductions and I want to make my bottom line on my, if I'm a sole proprietor, Schedule C, or even a small corporation, I want that bottom line to look as little as possible. So I don't have to give Uncle Sam any more money that I'm legally bound to. So that being said, that's great. But now I go to get a loan and my tax return looks horrible on paper. And they're going, well, I'm sorry, you don't make enough money. Mm -hmm. But what if I have great credit and I know I've got the cash flow from my business and I know I have enough money to put down payment? Well, that's where these programs originally started. So if you had a substantial down payment, and I'm saying, 20, 25, 30, 35% down payment, and I have great credit, and I, I know I've got plenty of reserves in the bank. I've got money to back it up. 
that's probably not a very risky loan because you're just stating what your gross income was before the deductions mm -hmm. that offset that taxable amount. So mm -hmm. those programs are great. And then they started to morph a little bit, and that's where the problem started when they doing the old fog the mirror loans. Mm -hmm. Well, the meltdown happened, and now finally we are getting back to new trends now, what they call non-QM, as in quality mortgage. Mm -hmm. So we're looking back at now bank statement programs and things that are similar to stated, but they're going back to the old standards, which a few minutes ago I said, which I thought were great. Show me lots of money in the bank, show me excellent credit, show me the ability to pay, and reserves in the bank to back up in case I get into a problem. I'm not going to lose 100000 200000 in equity on a property that I purchased using a loan like that. Mm -hmm. If a real problem arises, I'm going to sell it mm -hmm. and save my credit. So those trends are starting to come back now where they're using common sense, either bank statement programs or semi-stated income. And by bank statements, I mean show me your business Mm -hmm. Bank statements show me the cash flow to prove that the income's really there, and we'll do our equation and say, yeah, we'll use this as your income, and you can get a loan, and then that whole tax return problem goes away again. So that is a huge trend and probably one of the fastest growing areas of the entire mortgage market nationwide in a huge way. Okay. So that's just one, and I have to do kudos to all of you hard work, working entrepreneurial women out there is one of the fastest growing demographics in today's purchase market and this is national mind you is all of you professional single women out there women single women business owners are the fastest growing arena of home buyers first time home buyers in the united states so the women have got the guys beat back, you know, coming and going on this one. Apparently, they seem to be a little bit more conservative with their money and a little bit more focused on the long term. And I'm, for one, I'm glad to see it there. So give, your, cool. give yourselves a pat on the back for that one. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Well, John, it has been so interesting to talk to you today and before uh, we wrap up I, I wanted you to have another chance to to mention about your um, home access program for anyone who wasn't on the line at the beginning when you first talked about it so if you could just give us a brief recap of what that program is and then sure. um, get your contact information too okay absolutely well first time uh, this, the, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The Home Access Program uh, that we put together for CWI members and their businesses, if they are business owners, we can duplicate the whole contract, mm -hmm. is to give a monetary discount, rather substantial ones, to anybody who is either buying a property, who is refinancing their property, or even in some cases for a seller of a property. We as a lender, if there's a loan involved, uh, Skyline Home Loans will credit to all of the members $1,000 to offset closing costs, out-of-pocket expenses in the form of appraisal, whatever, to reduce those fees. And if there is a sale or a purchase involved, we can make a referral to a CWI um, authorized realtor who has agreed to take 20% of their commission on a property and also offset the cost and credit that to the buyer and or the seller. And the example I used of like a $600,000 purchase, those combined dollar figures came up to uh, $4,000. And again, I don't know of another program out there that just by your membership alone in our organization uh, will give you that kind of a credit. So there you have it. That's great. That's great. Anyone have any last questions for John before we wrap up for the day? I have learned so much. I really appreciate this. Well, it was my pleasure. And any time I can be of service or help, and I encourage anybody. If oftentimes, you know, Patty, I do radio uh, with my financial planner and estate planning attorneys every week. Uh, we have regular shows and we talk about financial wellness, etc. 
your fiscal fitness, as I like to say. Yeah. So I encourage people when we have questions and, you know, interchange like this, uh, it'll usually prompt another question after we're all hung up and gone. So I just tell people, give me a call. I don't mind answering questions. I do it all day long here in my office in North County coastal area. And if folks want to call me, uh, I'm more than happy to handhold, even if it's just a second opinion. That's what I'm here for. Well, why don't you share that phone number with everybody, John? And sure. uh, is, is that the best way to reach you is by phone? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I hate to say, I, unfortunately, I live in my office half the time. So, But that number, that's my direct uh, hard line is 760 area code 944-6555. Five five five, and I'll say it again: seven sixty area code nine forty four sixty five fifty five. Or to shoot me an email, and it's simple: John B J O H N B at Skyline, just like it sounds: S K Y L I N E Home Loans H O M E L O A N S dot com. That's great. Great. Thank you so much again, John. I really appreciate the time that you uh, have given to us today. And it's nice to just know that we've got options again. You know, things looked pretty dark there for a while. And so it's nice to know that we've got, you know, just options for us. Choices. Choices. Yes. Good, good yes, thing. choices. We're, we're back to normal. And it was my pleasure again. Thank you very much for inviting me. All right. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great day and, and a great rest of the week. Bye now.